Thank you. And the floor is actually not moving this year. Last year, I lectured on my uh, treadmill desk in my office. I decided to do a standing lecture, maybe a bit of a shifting back and forth lecture. They're both uh, better than sitting. Uh, we used to say sitting is the new smoking. Uh, now maybe sitting is the new saturated fat for this lecture. But welcome, everybody. Happy to be lecture number 114. I feel like a biblical chapter. Uh, all the doists and uh, such, but hopefully everybody will learn, and I'm going to present you uh, information going back to at least the 1950s, right up to the most modern, cutting-edge, exciting, new. New isn't always better, but uh, new can be exciting, and it will be. So I am going to um, see which of these is going to work for me. I think everybody can see that, so we're in good shape. Plant nutrition in the heart, important new data. Okay, so buckle up, everybody pay attention. Take your notepad out, and here we go. I will just say, you saw my short video introduction. I am a practicing cardiologist. It's always an interesting term. That means I actually see new patients, return patients, and the term practicing, I guess, means one day I'll get it all right, but I think I get a lot of it right right now. I recommend plant-based nutrition, so that's an important foundation. Uh, along with a, other integrative approaches like sleep and fitness. Uh, I am a professor of medicine at our medical school, and I am in southeastern Michigan in a suburb of Detroit called Bingham Farms. All right, heart disease deaths. It's enough. It's stop. Let's end this uh, true uh, epidemic uh, where for 105 years straight, every year, come on, somebody take the title. But nobody will take the title. Heart diseases kill more people in the United States than any other diagnosis code, even compared to all cancers. Every single cancer lumped together can't overcome heart disease for deaths. And during the peak of COVID, COVID was a serious contender, sadly, uh, but it has fallen off, thank goodness. But heart disease has not. Heart disease death rates are not plummeting. The 2022 numbers came out recently. There's no beautiful slide like this yet, but heart disease is number one again, sadly. And you've heard it over and over. Is it all preventable? Absolutely not. There are genetic inputs. Uh, there is the challenge of getting universally a uh, optimal lifestyle of nutrition and sleep and fitness. But can a large majority of deaths be uh, prevented? And can heart disease be detected early? And can it be reversed? And is plant-based nutrition an important part of the reversal? Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. If I asked four questions, I gave four yeses. I may have given one yes too many. Um, and we have to do that. And we have to get aggressive. So I'm going to spend a little time on that topic, which may not seem like a plant-based topic, but how can we reverse heart disease if we can't measure it? I think there's a famous automotive consultant for those of you in that field, Edward Deming, who said you cannot improve what you can't measure. And in heart disease, that may be the single most exciting advance that has nothing to do with arugula. We can measure like never before. So we're gonna talk for a minute about not dying of heart disease and knowing something that we should just talk right off our tongue in my clinic, we do. We talk about that every 40 seconds, somebody in the United States has a heart attack, a really shocking number. So that means that in this two-hour slot, maybe about 160 people in the United States, 150 will have a heart attack. I hope they all do okay, but that's shocking. And even more shocking is about every 35 seconds, somebody dies, because there actually are even more deaths than uh, heart attacks. And most shocking, everybody listen, write this down, is there's something called sudden cardiac death. It's one thing to be 93 years old, have your family and your uh, pastor, your rabbi, your priest, or your shaman, uh, or uh, your leader of your faith around you in a hospice situation and close your eyes and pass on to the next world at age 93. But a thousand people a day drop dead suddenly of heart disease called SCD, sudden cardiac death. Can't say goodbye. You're just gone. And we have to do better 
because those are tragic and those are 35 year olds and 44 year olds and 52 year olds and they're men and they're women and occasionally even young uh, people. Uh, we thought that Demar Hamlin, the football player, I think age 24 was going to be one of them, but by close proximity and youthfulness, he was resuscitated on that football field. But that's the kind of event that most people, 90% of people don't survive. So if you know your arterial age, your driver's license might say, in my case, I'm 64 years old uh, as of two days ago. Thank you. But uh, what are your arteries saying? They might say 84. You got a problem, NASA. They might say 44. Mine are pretty youthful. I'm glad to say this is my 46th year of eating plant-based diet since I was 18. And I have to believe it wasn't random that my arteries are squeaky clean. And it wasn't family history because my father of blessed memory had a very significant amount of heart disease uh, in his 50s and made it a lot longer than that. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, that was the case. So back in the 1600s, I said we were going to go back to the 1950s. I underestimated. We're going back uh, nearly 400 years. We'll have to celebrate the birthday of Dr. Thomas Einam, the most famous English physician of his era, wrote a textbook that was used for about 200 years throughout Europe. A person, let's keep it real here, is as old as his, her arteries. Thomas Einam, English scientist and physician. But how do you know about your arteries and how can you use plant-based nutrition to reverse them if you don't know? So there's only about three different ways, four different ways to really identify if your arteries are youthful, hopefully, or not. And you know, not everybody has eaten a plant-based diet for 46 years. Some have done it for six months and you carry a little baggage as to what you were doing before. You also carry genetic baggage and blood pressure baggage and blood sugar baggage and uh, other uh, features like perhaps prior smoking. So there is an ultrasound you can find in your community, we do it in my clinic, it's not as common as I wish it were based on 2000 research studies, but you can have an ultrasound of your neck, painless, no radiation, and that ultrasound will measure and give you your arterial age. It says it right on the report. You're 64 years old and your arteries are like a 57 year old, for example, mine or something like that. I need to repeat that, it's been about a year. Very good thing to do with a lot of science. If you don't have this optimal form of carotid imaging called CIMT, carotid intimal medial thickness, which is basically digital software to measure precisely what's going on, you could do a lifeline screening ultrasound in your community. It won't be as good, but if it says normal, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, and if it says severe, you're not in very good shape. Everything in between is a little fuzzy, in my opinion. You could go to the hospital and have your insurance pay for a carotid ultrasound, but same story as lifeline screening. This uh, is the accuracy you need. So for example, if you notice here in December 2016, a 59-year-old, uh, in this case, I believe it was a man, had an arterial age of 65. His arteries were older than his driver's license. But look what happened over a couple of years is that he got older. Hey, we can't help that. According to his driver's license, he was now 61. But what happened to the arterial age? Remember, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. It jumped down five years in the first year and jumped down another 12 years uh, in the second year. So it ended up being significantly younger in terms of arterial age than his biologic age. And that happens. That is proven science, uh, where he was worse than average in, in 2016 and better than average for age. So have hope. We can measure it. We can uh, institute a program. It's not all arugula. It's a lot of arugula. It's not all arugula. There's much more precision to it. Beyond the carotid study is a CT scan without any injection, without any IV, without any iodine dye called the coronary artery calcium score. Some people abbreviate it CACS, sometimes called a heart CT scan. And uh, there is radiation, very little in a modern hospital. If you go to a hospital with a big CT scanner, 
It's less radiation usually than a mammogram. It can be measured in something called millisieverts. And it's uh, usually less than one millisievert. It's painless. It takes about 10 seconds. And you want to be like example A, where the yellow arrow is pointing to a big heart artery without any white spots. White spots are not um, mold or thrush or lime or dandruff. They're calcified plaque, hard plaque, hardening the arteries. So you look at panel B, panel B's got a problem. Panel B does not have youthful heart arteries, but much better than patient C, another person asymptomatic, plain pickleball on the tennis court, but full of a horrendous amount of calcified plaque. So calcium is a marker of plaque. It's not the only thing in arteries. There are white blood cells. There are scar collagen tissue. There is soft um, non-calcified plaque. And we can get a partial description of how old your heart arteries are for a very inexpensive test. In some states like Texas, insurance will pay for this. In most states, it will not. In my area, it ranges from $50 to $125 out of pocket. Pretty reasonable. And it still requires a prescription from a healthcare provider, except in some states. I believe in uh, Cleveland, you could go to the university and they'll do this free for you if you walk in and schedule it. And I think that's maybe true in Indiana too, um, where you don't need a physician prescription. You don't want to do it a lot. We're not going to go into this in depth, but we don't really have any data that we can uh, diminish the calcification. We can diminish the overall plaque, but part of that plaque is calcified plaque, and we don't have any strong data we can shrink the calcified plaque. So if your calcium score is high, I won't do it again. I already know what I need to know. Danger, danger. And we can compare it to databases. And you can calculate your 64 years old and your arterial age by calcium score is 78. That's a worrisome situation. And then we can work to reverse it, but we will not lower the calcium score. We'll lower the other components. So hang on. But look how important coronary calcium scoring is. If you just look, let's look at the one that says to the right, diabetic patients with a calcium score of zero, followed up over four to five years, at a very low rate, a very low rate of dying of heart disease, almost zero. But if their calcium score is over a thousand, like the example you saw a moment ago, their risk of dying of heart disease in the first three and a half years might be 20%. That's a huge difference for a 50 to $75 uh, one minute test that's painless and involves no injection. So no risk to arteries, of the kidneys or kidney tissue, no risk of allergies if you're uh, iodine sensitive, I, uh, which is what the contrast is. But the real excitement, am I fired up about this topic? Yes, is that if we have a reason or a motivated patient, we can take that coronary CT scan, we can put an IV in, and we can inject iodine contrast. 50 to 60, sometimes 80 cc's, milliliters of non-ionic iodinated contrast, iodine. So you can't be allergic to iodine and you have to have healthy kidneys. And you hold your breath and you feel warm, then you breathe normal and you get a Band-Aid where your IV was and you go home, drink some water, nice purified uh, water. And the interpretation usually is done by eyeball. How much calcification do you have? Sometimes the coronary CT angiogram, abbreviated CCTA, will include a calcium score. Sometimes it won't. And some experienced reader will say, this artery looks 25% narrowed. This spot looks 25 to 50% narrowed. This spot looks 50 to 75% narrowed. This spot looks over 75% narrowed. Uh, but it's not quantitative. It's not computer read. It's not artificial intelligence. But it's still better, more involved, and more expensive. In my city, if you want to pay cash for a coronary CT angiogram, it's about $700. Much more expensive, seven times more expensive, but seven times more informative, too. 
It also involves a bit more radiation, like two or three of the calcium scores uh, because the machine is on just a little bit longer. But you can measure, this is the exciting advance. This is the exciting advance, uh, audience, is that computers are now measuring these coronary CT angiograms. Computers are using artificial intelligence. And never before could we talk about how many cubic millimeters of plaque, how many cubic millimeters of non-calcified plaque, how many cubic millimeters of dangerous low attenuation plaque, and how many cubic millimeters of calcified plaque existed in each and every heart artery and overall. This happens to be from a study where they're evaluating what happens if you treat people for a year with heart disease with statin therapy or placebo. And it's one of the pieces of evidence that if you want to reverse heart disease, you don't necessarily throw every prescription drug away as worthless. There is science that they are part of the approach if you're willing to go down that road with a doctor who will work with you, in my case, using very low doses in combination, but it works. And you can shrink your plaque. Dr. Ornish didn't have access to this technology. Dr. Esselstyn did not. Mr. Pritikin did not. We're going to talk about them. But every cardiologist has access to this if they're up to date. And you might want to talk about that. This might look like crazy pictures. Look over to the left. But those are heart arteries in 2018 and 2021 um, imaged by coronary CT angiograms. And all those other numbers uh, in the middle and on the right uh, indicate over the course of three years, did the plaque get better or worse with the treatment offered? We never could measure it this accurately before. And what I'm looking at is in the three years, and I'll read it to you, the total plaque volume went from 313 to 317. So it basically stopped. The non-calcified soft plaque went down from 290 to 240. That's nice. That's almost 20% shrinking the soft non-calcified plaque. The calcified plaque went up a little from 23 to 76 cubic millimeters. That's what age and statins do, but calcified plaque may be um, more stable and less dangerous. And then finally, there is something, you won't be quizzed on this, but there's something called low density non-calcified plaque that's felt to be the most dangerous and that uh, completely uh, disappeared. So that's the kind of modern approach. We can do better than this, but this is a nice colorful example. That means we could do the studies everybody wants. Dr. Khan, let's finally do the study. The Dr. Esselstyn no oil, whole food plant-based greens steamed with balsamic six times a day versus the same diet with four tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil on that steamed greens a day. Let's do that study. We could now. We have the ability. We just need somebody to come up with about half a million dollars in 100 patients, and we could do it. For example, here's a study using a tablet. Why did this study get done? Because the industry paid for it. The tablet was aged garlic. Aged garlic actually is a superpower in my clinic for heart plaque reversal. And this was a study where either placebo or AGE, aged garlic extract, was used for a year. If you look at the total plaque, it got much worse on placebo over a year. It barely changed with the aged garlic extract. The soft plaque similarly got significantly worse on placebo and almost stopped growing with the aged garlic extract. The most dangerous kind called low attenuation soft plaque went down significantly with garlic, a powerhouse, a superpower, and went up a little in the placebo group. And the calcium didn't change. Uh, you, want, you may want to remember this. It's the soft plaque that changes. When Dr. Esselstyn and Dr. Ornish demonstrated on heart catheterization's improvement, they didn't have the ability to say it was soft plaque, but all the science would say the soft plaque was shrinking away. So now there's something even more insane. And that was an example I just showed you. AI, artificial enhanced coronary CT angiogram, can be used as a non-invasive imaging modality 
with relatively low cost and relatively low risk. Those beautiful pictures I showed you can cost out of pocket as much as $1,500, whereas a calcium score can be $50. Uh, if my math is right, that's 30 times difference. But the amount of information is 30 times more. Bullet point number two, a coronary CT angiogram with artificial intelligence may allow more wide use to assess drug and food research on atherosclerosis progression and regression. And finally, in yellow at the bottom, you can track plaque now. My patients are going for these advanced CT scans if they agree, and they're going back in about two years. And I have examples where half of all the plaque in their heart arteries has shrunk in two years. Dramatic. Of course, diet plays a major role, but it's not the whole toolbox. There are other factors. And you saw one, aged garlic extract, something that every heart patient is recommended to be on in my clinic. So if you're not testing, you're guessing. And if you're guessing, you might be a statistic. A thousand people a day dying of sudden cardiac death. We have to squash that number, right? Eat squash regularly and squash a thousand people dying suddenly a day in the United States alone, let alone the whole world. Uh, it's uh, probably thousands and thousands a day around the world. All right. Heart disease is reversible and diet and lifestyle. What's the data using technology developed before? the coronary CT angiogram with artificial intelligence. I have no financial conflict. So the company that does those fancy CT scans is called Clearly Health, C-L-E-E-R-L-Y health.com. And through my clinic, I've been able to arrange that in about 20 states in the United States, efficiently and safely. Uh, usually no insurance coverage, sometimes very partial insurance coverage. So it is not an equal opportunity scan at this point, unfortunately, but we have to get more experience. And then I'm sure at some point it will be insurance covered and the price will drop. Uh, famous observation, when you're hungry and you have to go into the forest and eat root vegetables and leafs, uh, leafy greens that you find, heart disease drops significantly as occurred during World War II in Norway. There were other factors. People go crazy on Twitter when you show this slide because they say people stopped smoking too. They didn't have cigarettes. They were uh, barely alive. But uh, when you uh, go back to more primitive lifestyles where meat is a luxury or unavailable and uh, vegetable whole foods are the only sustenance, at least a factor in the drop in death rates from heart disease is diet changes. That led to a flurry of research in addition to the fact that after World War II, there was a rise in heart attacks, particularly in uh, executives came home from the war with cigarettes and wives went to work out of the house and carrying dinners became the rage and fast food. So from 1939 on, people were studying various dietary approaches to why does heart disease develop? Uh, it took a little longer to figure out there were other factors. Uh, by the 1960s, we were on top of cigarette smoking and diabetes and high blood pressure and family history. All those were figured out. But diet was the original focus. So let's give credit to an internal medicine doctor in Los Angeles, now deceased, just around the corner in my office. I have uh, many books by Dr. Lester Morrison. Um, and he had a large practice of patients with heart disease. But in 1948 and 49, there wasn't much to offer. So he developed a handout, and this is the handout. He gave his heart patients a handout, cut most of the fat out of your diet, which really means cut most of the animal foods out of your diet, get rid of the liver and the brain and the very fatty meats and the whole dairies and butters and the egg yolks and the baked goods and desserts, the concentrated fats, neon butter, uh, lard, and the rest, rich gravies, olives, nuts, avocados, get rid of them. And he saw some responsiveness. So he did actually, that's why this is so fundamentally important. He did a randomized study, the thing that people look for. 
the thing that's never been done with the ketogenic diet, the carnivore diet, the paleolithic diet, and heart patients. Dr. Morrison took 100 patients who had a heart attack in the last six months, and he gave them that handout, or he told them, see you every so often, and uh, followed them. After three years, the men dropped weight, 25 pounds, 166 to 141. These were skinny Americans in 1951. And the women dropped on average 21 pounds, 145 to 124. And without any cholesterol medicine, the cholesterol fell from over 300 to 220. Uh, as an average, that's an incredibly powerful average. And people felt well. They said their heart symptoms got better. Their energy was good. This was a sustainable diet. But most dramatic was the 12-year follow-up that Dr. Morrison published a little later, that none of the control group, the people that were eating fast foods and donuts and baked goods and butter and lard, uh, were alive. And about half of the heart patients at a very early time, I call it primitive time, Neanderthal time in terms of heart care, half of them were still alive or just about half of them. So very exciting data that was published so people could read it. So maybe Mr. Nathan Pritikin, a aerospace engineer, could read the data. And Mr. Nathan Pritikin was a very curious engineer, not an MD. He was in Santa Barbara uh, creating products for the US government and others in the aerospace field. And he was curious what Dr. Morrison was doing because it was in the newspapers. And he went down and got his cholesterol checked and it was awful, it was over 300. And he was eating like a typical American celebrating post-World War II uh, booming economy, pretty much. And he said, I'm going to take that hand out and follow it. And his cholesterol fell ridiculously, I think, down to about 120 from over 300. Not everybody gets that response, but some do. And a lot of that is your microbiome and your genetics, whether you're APOE4 or APOE3, and whether you have something called APOC3 or not. So you can check genetically whether you're probably going to be a big time responder in terms of your cholesterol, the diet. And he said, I'm an engineer, but I'm going to start telling everybody I know about what happened to me and what Dr. Morrison's doing. And he ultimately uh, took over a hotel and started doing seminars and overnight stays and ultimately developed a three-week program. You can come to me with obesity or diabetes or high blood pressure or anginal chest pain, and my team will work with you. Ultimately, his team included doctors, he wrote this up. His books were world famous and multi-million uh, copy sellers. He also incorporated fitness. He loved to run even in his clothes between meetings. He was a very high energy man. Um, and he published research with medical doctors so that the research could get into journals, even though there was resistance. Some didn't want an engineer to publish research a three-week inpatient stay in a hotel setting with all the food provided and exercise. Exercise could be walking 100 feet. Exercise could be a light jog, depending on your status. The fat content was low based on Dr. Morrison's work. It was plant-based. There were occasional meals of fish and bison. There were thousands of people recorded in a database before there was the internet and Excel spreadsheets. And cholesterol fell and weight fell and blood pressure fell and symptoms improved and quite remarkable data that clinically people could reverse their cardiovascular disease. Uh, if he's ever had an example of a heart catheterization reverse, I've not seen it, but people felt better. Of course, one of the patients was the famous grandmother of Michael Greger, MD, of the book, How Not to Die and How to Diet. Um, and his grandmother walked in as a cripple, uh, basically being given a very short uh, prognosis and walked out soon thereafter in excellent shape uh, and lived decades. So there was this data from Dr. Morrison, data from Mr. Pritikin, and there comes a young medical student who in 1978, 1979, he was like 22 or 23 years old, put some people in a hotel room fed them whole food plant-based diets, but because of an influence he had early in his own life on Eastern meditative and yoga practices, here is his guru, literally, uh, Sachi Dananda, a very famous author and yogi and uh, 
writer and uh, speaker, uh, gave the opening address at uh, the famous Woodstock uh, Festival. Uh, Dr. Ornish incorporated more than just food. He did lifestyle. He did stress management. He did yoga. He did love and connection and groups and walking. And he, in 1979, then published in 1983, uh, if my math is right, 40 years ago, published a small pilot study that people felt better and their stress tests got better quickly with what is now called the Ornish Lifestyle Program. He went back to school, he graduated medical school, then he took another year off because now he was able to get some funding uh, from some big shots. And he did uh, what's called the Lifestyle Heart Trial, now a randomized study using a food pyramid largely of whole foods, vegetables, fruits, beans and legumes, whole grains, non-fat products like cereals, whole grains. Uh, this was uh, you know, 1986, 87, 88, 89. So he did let people have some non-fat dairy and some egg whites under the advice of some nutritional experts that uh, uh, this was all pre-Trader Joe, Whole Foods and other markets like that, fresh time. Uh, people uh, were scrambling to create recipes. Moderate exercise, stress reduction, smoking cessation. Published in 1990, in fact, July 21, 1990, the one-year results. Then he published the five-year results. And the five-year results should be hanging in every cardiology office in the world like they hang in mine. Um, what happens to 48 patients where half of them get usual care, <clears throat> all of them having moderate to severe heart blockage, and half of them get intensive lifestyle group support, the Ornish program, five-year follow-up. And they had a heart catheterization before, in the middle, and at the end of the study. They volunteered to do this because there was no coronary CT angiography at the time. You had to do it invasive, but it's basically the same approach. And to Dr. Ornish's amazing credit, he had computers read these catheterizations, not eyeballs, because eyeballs doesn't cut it for precision, no matter how good you are. And if you look over at the baseline, <coughs> excuse me, the average amount of narrowing in the heart arteries altogether was 41% in the two groups. The control group got worse and worse over five years. Look at the red. If you see red, you have a problem. Look at the black dots. And they got worse and worse. What happened to the white squares? The amount of narrowing got better and better. And I'm suggesting to you that was soft plaque that was regressing. It didn't just stay the same, it got better. First time ever demonstrated. There also were in these patients blood flow measurements by something called PET scans, PET, positon emission tomography. And the amount of blood flow increased three to 400% on average. Amazing, because when arteries get even a little bit cleaner, there's a lot more blood flow because of the function of four to the radius of the artery. And this is important work. Along with the catheterization data where the symptoms improved in the people in the treatment group with the white squares, their number of hospitalizations and need for medication and treatments was half. And it was well established in this very carefully done study. As Dr. Ornish has always said, if you do a very carefully done, precise study, you don't necessarily need a thousand people. You know, uh, you want to figure out if a uh, parachute works jumping out of a plane, you need maybe one example of the control group. You're not going to do a thousand. So he had very precise measurements. Uh, and no disrespect for people that do skydiving. You're not going to see me doing that with a parachute of any kind. All right. That was 1998. Then 12 years later, with a lot of persistent work, both the Ornish organization and the Pritnikan organization finally convinced Medicare that they had enough data because they went on and expanded the numbers. Ultimately, for the Ornish program, there were more than 3,000 patients uh, described uh, that had been treated. And in the Pritikin program, as you saw, there were similarly thousands of people that Medicare said will approve this special kind of cardiac training, cardiac rehabilitation, but only after certain situations, not for prevention, for people with chronic angina, 
for people with recent bypass, recent balloon or stents, uh, recent heart attacks, recent valve surgery, will pay for it. So there's always been a program for many decades called cardiac rehabilitation. But now we had something called ICR, intensive cardiac rehabilitation. And it is now, um, help me out here, 13 years later, and there are a lot of these programs, but there's still uh, a fraction of the number we need. Uh, Dr. Ornish's program has just gone on to become a virtual program. So you don't have to find a facility in your area that will um, supervise you uh, on site. You can do it at home with live Zoom group meetings, fitness, cooking, meditation, and yoga. Uh, exciting stuff. I'm sure if you go to ornish.com, you can learn more about that. You have to bring up the famous, the energetic, and the wonderful Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn at the Cleveland Clinic, a surgeon who transitioned in the 1980s to have a hunger to learn about and then stop uh, heart disease using nutrition. He published uh, real research at the Cleveland Clinic in medical journals, a strategy to arrest and reverse coronary disease, a 12-year longitudinal study of a single physician's practice. He's published updated research in as many as 198 patients that he has counseled I think in about 2014, uh, God bless at age 89 plus, he's still lecturing with great energy and vigor. You'll find him on many up-to-date YouTubes and even some meetings still. Uh, what did he do? He created a diet. He excluded added oils, fish, fowl, meat, and dairy. And he created a plant-based, uh, very low fat content diet. He did allow statin medication to be used if needed to control the cholesterol, and he encouraged exercise, but it wasn't a structured part of the program. Dr. Esselstyn is famous for his insistence that oil injures the endothelium, the inner lining of arteries. We're going to talk about that a little later on. Ask ourselves, is that still the modern science or not without any disrespect? But he also published some of the most famous pictures in medical journals about heart disease reversal using heart catheterization, not the modern coronary CT angiogram. I can show you from my clinic examples of dramatic reversal using coronary CT angiogram now, but at the time you had to go inside the body and inject the dye. And on the left in 1996 and on the right in 1999, um, there is major improvement of a narrowed segment called the distal left anterior descending or left uh, LAD artery associated with dramatic clinical improvement. So yes, heart disease uh, is reversible with diet and lifestyle. I'm going to go off on a little tangent, which is a controversy that exists certainly on Twitter and to a small degree in the actual medical literature but to a very small degree in the standard cardiology and academic world, that of all the diet aspects uh, that might be related to heart disease and might be modified by diet to lower the risk of heart disease or reverse heart disease, saturated fat remains in the focus. In all worldwide guidelines from international organizations, for example, in America, the American Heart Association, it is to lower the saturated fat. That's different from the trans fat, which should be lowered too, but it has largely been eliminated as a food additive. It's different than monounsaturated fats, different than polyunsaturated fats. Those are usually coming from nuts and seeds and various oils. Uh, you wanna lower the saturated fat, why? Because in the 1950s and 60s, a hypothesis was brought up that Foods high in saturated fat, like marbled meats and cheeses and whole dairy and egg yolks, and I would add coconut oil and palm oil, raise blood cholesterol, serum cholesterol. Uh, serum cholesterol, LDLC is circulating, and if there's injured endothelium lining of the arteries, it can be incorporated into the inner lining and start an inflammation and irritation and get a whole uh, chain reaction that leads to plaque. And if that is ongoing over years and years, it'll be narrowing. And then you can have it rupture 
and you can have a heart attack, or you can have a situation where you have to go to the emergency room, or you can have a situation where you have SCD, sudden cardiac death. So saturated fat is a risk factor, not the only risk factor. Some people eat diets high in saturated fat and don't drop dead rapidly. There's no doubt it's a risk factor. Some people smoke and don't get heart disease and cancer, but you wouldn't encourage it on a public health basis. Uh, test, not guess, know your arteries, please. And the reason we learned a lot about saturated fat was this gentleman, Dr. Ansel Keys. He had two PhDs, professor of epidemiology at University of Minnesota. He died in 2004 at age 100.5. His diet worked pretty well for his longevity. And he made this observation. If you notice the graph he's pointing to, it's an actual graph. Then the city of Minneapolis, there was an overall drop in disease rates, except for one disease called heart disease. And the heart disease rates were going up and up. And he did a study of executives in, heart, in uh, Minneapolis in the late 40s, one of the first done around the same time. The Framingham study was just starting outside of Boston. And he got very interested in the role of diet. When he talked to colleagues in Naples, Italy, who said they rarely ever see a heart attack. And he said, we have so many heart attacks in Minneapolis, it's a problem. And uh, he went and visited Naples and he learned about the Mediterranean diet, which was not yet known in the United States. And who's responsible for educating the United States about the Mediterranean diet? Dr. Ansel Keys. He wrote three books on the topic I'll show you. And Dr. Keys got um, co-researchers in uh, seven countries and 16 communities to get different styles of diet, United States diets, Finnish diets, Yugoslavian diets, Japanese diets, Greek diets, Italy diets, Netherlands diets, very different fat contents. And they followed these people from 1958 to 1970, it was all men, about 12,000 observational, extremely detailed studies, all done before the internet, before there were laptops, incredibly hard work on a small budget. And what stimulated Dr. Keyes was this kind of observation. Not all fats were the same for the risk of coronary artery disease. If you look to your left, in Japan in the 1950s, when Dr. Keyes visited there, certainly in the area of Okinawa, the overall percentage of calories from fat, that's the purple bar, was about 10%. That's low. That's why Okinawa is famous. And the number of coronary heart disease cases in 10,000 men was very low. That's why Okinawa is or was famous. But if you go over to the Mediterranean basin, and I guess Finland is not exactly a Mediterranean company, country, excuse me, country. Well, you can see, compare Finland and Crete. Crete is very Mediterranean. The percentage of calories from fat were about 40% in both locations, Eastern Finland and the island of Crete. But the heart disease rates were more than 15 times different. There was the highest heart disease rate in uh, the world in Eastern Finland, and exceptionally low, even lower than Japan. But they were having all that fat, Dr. Khan, in Crete. But if you look below, it was not the milk, butter, and sausage of Eastern Finland, which was the source of a high saturated fat diet. In Crete, it was olive oil. And olive oil can be quite low in saturated fat, particularly extra virgin olive oil can be quite low. It's not zero, but it can be 10% or less in good quality um, extra virgin olive oil brands that are very high in polyphenols. Plus, it was all those wonderful fruits and vegetables, whole grains and legumes that make up the Cretan diet, the Mediterranean diet. So not all fat was bad, Dr. Key showed. His seven country studies show it was saturated fat in the diet, those meats, those cheeses, those egg yolks, uh, those pastries, pastries were very dangerous, like croissants with all that butter and uh, white flour. And the higher the percentage of calories and saturated fat in these locations, the higher was the heart attack and death rate. So Dr. Keyes wrote books about the wonderful Mediterranean diet. He wrote them with his wife, Margaret, and uh, they became the mainstay. They were all enormous bestsellers starting in the 1960s and 70s. And that's why we know today about the Mediterranean diet. Thank you, Dr. Ansel Keys. Uh, his Wikipedia used to be a very ugly, negative 
a bashing of Dr. Keys by paleo and keto people. It still happens all the time on the internet. But I wrote uh, a couple biographies of Dr. Keys and it swayed the pendulum. So now his Wikipedia is much more balanced. All right, let's jump into this topic in a little detail. We'll get you awake here for sure. Does olive oil harm arteries? Should I be going no oil, no oil, no oil? And you just have to understand that arteries are a complex structure, but the inner lining we often talk about is like a wallpaper, one cell thick called the endothelium. Um, there's actually a mucousy coating on the endothelium called the glycocalyx, even more uh, protective. So we have several mechanisms to prevent those plaques from getting under the endothelial cells and starting to become um, clinically relevant by maintaining a healthy glycocalyx, G-L-Y-C-O-C-A-L-Y-X, uh, eating green seaweed and brown seaweed and something called fucodin, uh, which is a supplement may help your uh, uh, glycocalyx and keeping your endothelium healthy. So, you know, smoking damages the endothelium, diabetes damages the endothelium, high blood pressure damages the endothelium. We have reason to believe that high saturated fat foods like coconut oil damage endothelium. Well, what about olive oil? All right, my hero, my friend, my colleague, my mentor. So there is a process to measure blood flow in the arm. And remember an arm is not a heart, but an arm is available for research and an arm has arteries and the arteries have endothelial cells too. So it's a model to evaluate does it does a intervention like a drug or a diet lead to more blood flow or less blood flow? Is the endothelium appearing to be happy or hurting from whatever the intervention is? So here's a study from 2007 where olive, soybean, and palm oil intake were given to healthy young subjects, 10 healthy young volunteers. They got potato soup. And then there was two ounces of the oil, the three different kinds of oils. It could be fresh oil, could be fried oil. Oh my God, what happens with fried oil? It must be totally distorted. Anything good about it, anything good in olive oil is totally gone if you've got fried olive oil. They measured at one in three hours this flow. And in all meals, didn't matter what the oil was, the flow that was measured dropped by about a third. But they didn't do a control group. They could have done the potato soup without any oil. I uh, would suggest to you that there would have been a drop in flow media dilatation because every meal causes a transient drop in flow media dilatation. I'll show you that in a minute. And salt causes a transient drop. There probably was a fair amount of salt in the potato soup. So you might say oil is harmful. I would say food is harmful and salty food is harmful. and um, Fried olive oil is harmful, no doubt about that. There is this uh, event, just to know, called metabolic endotoxemia. I've given lectures for over an hour just on that topic. But if you look at the bottom left, in animals for sure, high fat feeding like coconut oil can cause some changes in the gut lining where you get more spaces between the gut cells. They're called enterocytes. They allow some products from the gut bacteria and toxins to enter the body that aren't really welcome in the body. This happens after every meal, but it can happen more or less. And those toxins can lead to inflammation and changes in metabolism, like a uh, high, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, an elevated um, blood sugar, an elevated uh, hemoglobin A1C, uh, other markers of inflammation like myeloperoxidase. Ah, this is an animal study. And um, looking at the release of these toxins from the gut into the blood after a variety of meals. Now it is an animal study and was done for up to five hours. Not exactly a perfect example, but it's famous. I want you to see that if they gave these animals the blue column called saline, anything you do and put in the gut causes a little bit of uh, release of toxins. It's the nature of feeding. Uh, it went up fivefold. If you look at cod, fish, and vegetables, it wasn't much of a rise. Olive oil was a little bit more than cod, fish, and vegetable oil. 
But coconut oil was the winner of the award for the most irritating to the gut cells and the most releasing of endotoxins. When people uh, say, well, coconut oil is a healthy choice, that I push back a little bit because coconut oil is 85% generally saturated fat, and that is higher than anything else on the planet I'm aware of, palm oil being right there with it. Let's talk about this study. Let's break this down. This is our pictures from the Game Changers movie, if you remember. This is the famous Dr. Robert Vogel, MD study. That's Dr. Vogel in the check shirt. He was my mentor at the University of Michigan over 40 years ago, uh, still a wonderful uh, senior cardiologist for sure. And he published this study in 2000 that many people quote, yes, the Mediterranean diet is good and it's good on endothelial function. But are some parts of the Mediterranean diet better than others? Is it maybe the fruits and vegetables are good and maybe that olive oil isn't good? So he did a study where he gave some healthy volunteers. And if you quickly look at the study, it, he did that flow mediated dilatation uh, evaluation on the arm, FMD. And you could conclude if you quickly read the paper, that olive oil reduced the flow media dilatation 31%. The other meals did not. Olive oil damages endothelium. No oil, no oil, no oil. But that's not the case if you actually read the paper. Number one, if you look at the heading of the paper, table two, there only were 10 healthy subjects and it only was a few hours of follow-up. This is not a real life uh, heart disease patient example. But take it for what it is. There's two uh, segments here. It's called preprandial. What was the measurement before a meal? Postprandial, what was the measurement for a few hours after a meal? And there were actually five different meals. The only one anybody talks about is the first column. When you eat olive oil and bread, the measurements in these 10 volunteers, the flow media dilatation went from 14 to 9.9. .9, that's called FMD percent, down about 31%. Looks Statistically significant, it looks like maybe a bad idea. Well, look what happens when you have canola oil in bread. The FMD drops, but not statistically significant. Does that mean that we should be using canola oil because it's okay for the endothelium? What about salmon and crackers? Same thing, dropped a little bit, not much. We don't encourage salmon in our diet, but this is science. What about olive oil, bread, and antioxidant vitamins? The flow media dilatation did not drop like it did without the antioxidant vitamins. Maybe we can have olive oil for the gourmet nature of it and just take some antioxidants. And then I want you to look way to the right. The real deal is the way people eat in Italy. Olive oil, bread, salad, and vinegar. That's called a panzanella salad. What happened to the flow media dilatation even though there was olive oil? It didn't statistically significantly drop. All the meals dropped. Every meal drops. When you eat, you create metabolic endotoxemia and you get a very small, transient, innocent, unimportant release of toxins in the blood that affect your endothelium. So one option would be to stop eating everything. Not going to work very well. We got to judge. And I argue that if you eat like a Mediterranean and you look at this data, you would not be pounding the table, no oil, no oil. Your endothelium can tolerate a real meal. Uh, again, the reason this happens with every meal. So this is a beautiful picture of uh, a panzanella salad, bread, salad, tomatoes, vinegar, and olive oil. And uh, it's delicious. And according to Dr. Vogel's study, it's relatively harmless on your endothelium. Now, I wouldn't put chicken on it, I wouldn't put salmon on it. I wouldn't put uh, cheese on it. I think that's some artichoke heart uh, in there, not cheese. I would not do that. But uh, according to the data, it doesn't get two thumbs down in terms of endothelial function. What are the limitations of the Vogel study? Very small, 10 volunteers, three hours, not heart patients. No olive oil only group. Remember, it could have been the bread they were eating in the famous uh, column one. It was extra virgin olive oil, but we don't know what brand. And I'm telling you, there's a difference. There is something nowadays available called high polyphenol extra virgin olive oil. They did not use. That's probably the healthiest version. 
And finally, vegans weren't studied and vegans have different microbiomes and vegans tolerate certain dietary insults or uh, uh, options or choices different than omnivores. So we don't know for sure. Uh, I have to bring up now, remember that was 10 healthy volunteers in the famous Vogel study. This is the study we should be talking more about. The Cordioprev study, C-O-R-D-I-O-P-R-E-V, or heart prevention study, out of Spain. It's uh, got many publications, coronary diet intervention with olive oil and cardiovascular prevention. This is, uh, in this particular paper, a September 2020 publication. There are others that are more recent. Let's read the title. Mediterranean diet and endothelial function in patients with coronary heart disease an analysis of the cardioprev randomized control trial. So wait, this is the Mediterranean diet like the Vogel study. This is endothelial function like the Vogel study. This is, however, heart patients. And this is a randomized controlled trial. How many patients? How long did they follow them? What did they do with their diet? Well, let's read this. It's a randomized trial of 1,002 heart patients, not 10 healthy volunteers. They all had coronary artery disease. They got put into two diets, a Mediterranean diet, 502 patients with high olive oil content in their diet, and a 500 patient group that had relatively low fat. In fact, they were encouraged to eat lots of legumes. We all love legumes like lentils. The two fat diets were the low fat diet was to keep the fat under 30%. Now that is not an Esselstyn in Ornish or a Pritikin diet. It's not. But compared to the control group, it was lower fat. And most importantly, they did make it a healthy diet. They kept the saturated fat low, even in the control arm. And in the Mediterranean diet, high olive oil arm, it was over 35% of calories from fat, kind of like Crete. But the saturated fat content was quite low. It was olive oil, which is very rich in MUFA, monounsaturated fatty acids, oleic acid, and polyphenols like hydroxytyrosol and oleopurin. Wonderful little uh, stuff. 1,002 patients. The Mediterranean diet group was given a liter of extra virgin olive oil um, a week to each family uh, for the participant in the study. The amount wasn't just for that participant, but it was for the whole family to use. And the low-fat diet group was encouraged to limit all types of fat, animal and vegetable, and increase complex carbohydrates like legumes. Our results, oh my God, I'm so excited. What'd they find? Suggests that the Mediterranean diet better modulates endothelial function compared with a low-fat diet is associated with a better balance of vascular homeostasis in coronary heart disease patients, even in those with severe endothelial dysfunction at baseline. Ah, the group eating the Mediterranean diet with over 35% of calories from fat from extra virgin olive oil had improved endothelial function. And I'm not going to go into detail. I've never, ever read a study that tested endothelial function as carefully, as thoroughly, as comprehensively. In this report, over one year, not over three hours, over one year, endothelial function improved, even if it was severe at baseline. So if you look, for example, at the purple boxes and the green boxes, the FMD is panel A at the top. At the end of a year, the low-fat diet with all those complex carbohydrates like lentils did improve, hooray. But the high-fat, 35% or greater extra virgin olive oil Mediterranean arm improved much more significantly. How about EPCs? Those are um, endothelial progenitor cells. Uh, my colleagues talk about those in their lectures. There were many, many more EPCs stimulated and released in the blood by the over 35% extra virgin olive oil diet. And there's also a, a vascular dust of debris. The debris in the, end, in the uh, blood and in the endothelial space went down, which is a good finding, much more in the Mediterranean high extra virgin olive oil diet. Quite remarkable data. Uh, what about in people in the same research study that had kidney impairment along with their heart disease? They separated those out. I'm going to read the conclusion. The long-term consumption of a Mediterranean diet rich in Evo, extra virgin olive oil, when compared to a lower-fat diet, 
may preserve kidney function is shown by a reduced decline in glomerular filtration rate in coronary heart disease patients with type 2 diabetes. So they subsetted out a super high-risk group, kidney issues, diabetes, heart disease, and the extra virgin olive oil arm had a improved uh, progression over the seven years of the Cordioprev study. What about the major findings, looking at if arteries improved in their appearance or got worse. So they did that with carotid ultrasound over five to seven years. Mediterranean diet reduces atherosclerosis progression in coronary heart disease analysis, the Cordoprev randomized control trial 2021. Let's read the two bullet points. The Mediterranean diet decreased intimal medial thickness carotid plaque at five years, maintained at seven years compared to baseline, the low-fat diet did not modify the intimal medial thickness in the carotid arteries. Conclusion, long-term consumption of a Mediterranean diet rich in extra virgin olive oil, if compared to a low-fat diet with high complex carbohydrates and low saturated fat, was associated with decreased atherosclerosis progression. Decreased progression is shown by reduced intimal medial thickness and carotid plaque height. Arteries looked better Carotid arteries look better. It's easier to look at carotid arteries than heart arteries in 1,002 patients. And finally, this is the overall results of the study. 1,002 patients followed for seven years for prime endpoints, heart attacks, strokes, bypass stents, and death. And the blue line is the lower fat group, less than 10% saturated fat. The red line is the over 35% fat diet with extra virgin olive oil and Mediterranean style. There were far fewer statistically significant. There was a 27% drop uh, in the unadjusted numbers and a 33% drop in the adjusted numbers of those that were eating the high extra virgin olive oil diet. What does this mean? They did better in the higher fat diet. This is the biggest study, the longest follow-up, with the most careful analysis, they actually had to stop the study early because there was so much benefit derived in this analysis. Uh, remarkable data in the Cordioprev study. And I'm sure we'll be hearing more about it because these publications keep coming and coming. What does the Harvard School of Public Health say? They say that trans fat is <coughs> the most associated with risk of death. Uh, most uh, of our trans fat has been legislated out of our diet, fortunately. They say that saturated fat, like the meat and the cheese and the butter, is associated with increased mortality, danger, danger. That's why I like that Cordia Prep study. They kept the saturated fat low, consistent with American Heart Association and other uh, public health measure guidelines. But what about these others? They say that mortality goes down. I see an avocado, olive, I see seeds, I see extra virgin olive oil, I see walnuts, I see more extra virgin olive oil, and I think uh, I think that's canola oil, and I see salmon. I'm not uh, uh, putting salmon on my plate for a lot of reasons, but those other yummies we can talk about in a uh, objective way. Conclusions, extra virgin olive oil, the whole food plant-based diet. There are no trials of a plant-perfect, no SOS diet versus a similar one where the only change was perhaps a couple tablespoons a day of extra virgin olive oil. There is no doubt that extra virgin olive oil is a healthy dietary fat and high polyphenol extra virgin olive oil, particular brands may be of even more benefit. A diet high in extra virgin olive oil is compatible with healthy arteries, healthy endothelium, plaque regression, and good outcome in general coronary disease patients on the Mediterranean diet. What is unknown is if extra virgin olive oil diminishes or enhances the health benefits of an otherwise no SOS diet. We have the technology. We just need somebody to come up and fund it and do it if we feel it's an important question. It certainly in the plant-based world generates lots of questions. Okay, so I'm going to move past this. And in my perspective, my stethoscope is on the olive oil as a healthy choice. Let's just talk about lignans for a little bit. They are a class of uh, food chemicals. They are richest in ground flax. Um, lignans uh, have an estrogen-like action uh, that uh, 
tends to cause endothelium to perform at a high level. Plant lignans are converted by bacteria to mammalian lignans, certain chemical names. And why do I bring up lignans? Uh, because their source is largely plant-based foods. Ground flaxseed is the winner, 294 milligrams and 100 grams of ground flaxseed. Sesame seeds, number two, 103 milligrams for 100 grams of sesame seed. Cashew nuts, number four at 56. What's the big deal? Well, there's at least some growing perspective uh, that encouraging patients to take in two tablespoons a day ground flaxseed or possibly sesame seeds or possibly some cashews has benefits. In a Harvard School of Public Health study of over 200,000 men and women who at baseline did not have uh, cancer or cardiovascular disease, the more lignans in the diet is calculated from food diaries every four years, the lower the risk of total coronary heart disease in men and women. So ground flaxseed is a source of being converted to omega-3 uh, end products, EPA and DHA. Ground flaxseed lowers blood pressure. Ground flaxseed lowers uh, cholesterol. Ground flaxseed may have some benefits for breast health and prostate health, but it may also provide these lignans. So don't shy away from your ground flaxseed. How about avocados? Remember Dr. Morrison, Mr. Pritikin, largely uh, Dr. Ornish, Dr. Esselstyn would say, not a fan, but uh, in the world of people eating, people love avocados. Are there any new data? In 2022, in the Journal of American Heart Association, again, Harvard School of Public Health looked at over 100,000 men and women, followed for about 32 years. They had very detailed dietary intakes. The second yellow bullet says, those with higher avocado intake, more than two servings a week, and a serving was half an avocado, had a lower risk of cardiovascular disease by 16% and a 21% lower risk of specifically coronary heart disease, meaning heart attacks, angina, stent, and bypass. If you replace half a serving a day of margarine, butter, egg, yogurt, cheese, or processed meats with the equivalent half a serving a day of avocado, you lowered your risk of cardiovascular disease. Higher avocado intake was associated with lower risk of cardiovascular disease in two large prospective cohorts of U.S. men and women. Again, this was not studied in whole food, plant-based, no SOS uh, uh, diets. It was not studied in people having active angina, walking to the mailbox at risk of bypass surgery, stents, and even uh, sudden cardiac death. It was in a broad population of nurses and doctors that were making up these two famous studies. But as a general statement, if you're a healthy person, as an avocado to be feared, it doesn't appear uh, that that's the case. Uh, this is a uh, study done in 2018. Avocado consumption increases in diet and risk factors for heart disease, where if you look at LDL cholesterol on avocados uh, in a meta-analysis, LDL cholesterol went down, HDL cholesterol went up, total cholesterol went down, the ratio went down and triglycerides fell significantly with avocados. All right, global burden of disease, the GBD study, the three top foods for life expectancy. This is a massive study that's been ongoing for 20 years and uh, is uh, looking at databases in over, I think, 180 or 190 countries. A meta-analysis using life table methods, looking at fruits, vegetables, whole grains, refined grains, nuts, legumes, fish, eggs, milk, dairy, red meat, processed red meat, sugar, sweetened beverages. And they published data, the estimated impact of food choices on life expectancy, a modeling study. What foods would give you the largest gain in your lifespan? Number one, believe it or not, was legumes. Two and a half years for females that eat a lot of beans, peas, and lentils two and a half years for males. Number two was whole grains, about the same range, two to 2.3 years, men and women. Nuts were number three. And these were more predictive of extended lifespan than fruits and vegetables, actually. And then the other two positive moves were less red meat and less processed red meat. If you ate less red meat, you gain one and a half to two years of life expectancy, less processed meat about the same. Amazing provocative data. In fact, if you look at the optimal diet, there's three green arrows on the left. Eating more legumes, whole grains, and nuts 
gives you more life expectancy. Cutting back on red meats, processed red meats, sugar sweetened beverages, refined grain and eggs give you more life expectancy. Now, fish, fruit, and veg fruit and vegetables fits in there. Uh, added oils didn't really cause any problem, but it didn't add and didn't detract. Uh, but it's interesting that the fruits and vegetables were not as powerful as legumes, whole grains, and nuts. So plan your diet accordingly. Conclusion, eat plants. This is my last slide as we approach uh, 80 minutes of conversation. Change is the only constant in life. One's ability to adapt to those changes will determine your success in life, so says uh, Benjamin Franklin. I bring that up because I have uh, provided some controversy here. Uh, the data going back to uh, Dr. Sidingham in the 1600s. I want to stress, uh, we talked about coronary CT angiography and precision imaging of heart arteries. And I want to stress that we've talked about the traditional database, fantastic database for heart disease reversal with whole food plant-based diets and some newer data that is provocative uh, of which you should always discuss with your health team, your health consultants, um, and I will just say, uh, it's not a battle, but um, there was a recent interview uh, where it was said, why does Dr. Joel Kahn and Dr. Kim Williams present data where extra virgin olive oil may have some cardiovascular benefits? And have they ever seen a patient reverse heart plaque without completely committing to a whole food plant-based, no added oil, no salt oil, sugar diet? And the answer is, I can't speak for Dr. Kim Williams, who knows the literature uh, as well as anybody in the world, but uh, I presented the literature and I've seen patients using coronary CT angiogram reverse uh, massive amounts of heart plaque uh, using diet, uh, supplements, exercise, stress management, and prescription drugs. And there are several different roads to the uh, colorful part of the Wizard of Oz story. So good stuff. I remain a hardcore vegan in my 46th year. All right. All right. So thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Khan, for that very informative um, presentation. There's definitely a lot to, to talk about that, uh, I guess, goes against a lot of the um, the the gospel that is uh, in the in the plant based uh, in the plant based community. So uh, what I want to do real quickly, uh, and just correct me if I'm wrong, you have about 15 minutes for Q and A. Is that correct, Dr. Khan? That'd be great. Okay. So um, I, I just want to go over a few things for the audience with regard with, with regard to how to ask questions. We don't take questions directly from chat. What we do is we ask you to raise your hand. Uh, the, and if you don't know how to do that in Zoom, the second button from the right is reactions. Click on that. You click on the raise hand function. When I call on you, just state where you're from and ask your question. And we just ask the questions are brief and on topic. And with that, I'm going to I'm going to throw the first question to the audience. So, Sophia, where are you from and uh, and what's your question? Hi, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Sophia from Canada. Uh, my question, please, is that I, uh, I am on a plant-based diet and would like to know how to lower blood pressure, pressure and avoid clots. My mom, my aunt died of uh, blood clotting and I would like to avoid it. Thank you so much, doctor. All right. Well, thank you. And in fact, uh, plant-based diets are clearly the best diet for maintaining a normal blood pressure through life. A lot of that is because it's the diet most associated with maintaining healthy arteries, healthy endothelium, avoiding uh, arterial stiffness, calcification, and aging of your arteries. So it fits in perfectly with the topic I talked about. Of course, if one ate a uh, suboptimal diet for 60 years and has just transitioned, it's going to take longer to see all the benefits, although the endothelium does respond rather quickly to transitioning to a whole food, plant-based, colorful uh, diet. Um, there are certain foods that are optimal for high blood pressure. Uh, the leafy greens, chewed, steamed, balsamic, other uh, vinegars are just magical. Uh, vinegars on food to help monitor your blood sugar spikes and help your endothelium. Uh, hibiscus tea, we often bring up uh, beets things that may uh, improve our ability to make nitric oxide in our arteries. Um, yeah, pine nuts are good. Watermelon, give a shout out to watermelon for blood pressure control. Uh, and generally it's the best. There just was a review article 
on this topic. I wrote about it yesterday on my clinic website, uh, which is conlongevitycenter.com. I'll put that in the chat. I just wrote an article yesterday about this new uh, summary uh, that really takes it to the science that the best diet for maintaining a normal blood pressure or reversing previous blood pressure problems is a whole food plant-based diet. Spices are great. I just would avoid salt uh, or at least minimize salt. And then in terms of blood clotting, I mean, talking as a doctor now, not just a nutritional uh, uh, oriented one, you know, there are genetic uh, reasons for excessive blood clotting. And if you've got a significant history of blood clotting, you should talk to your doctor about a panel, a blood clotting panel that he probably could code and uh, do it appropriately through your insurance coverage. You're in Canada, so I guess it's governmental uh, health coverage. But there's something called factor five, laden, and factor two, and protein C and protein S, and uh, anti-cardiolipin antibodies and the whole range. You probably should get a clotting panel because, you know, diet is wonderful, but if you've got genetic clotting disorder, you still might have risk. Uh, of course, if you've gotten through a good portion of your life without a blood clot, you hopefully don't have a clotting disorder. Um, you know, specifically, I don't have a particular food. We talk a little bit about turmeric and ginger and omega-3 fatty acids having a bit of a blood thinning effect. I think in general, a whole food plant-based diet, lower in saturated fat is uh, going to be more optimal for blood thinning than a meat and saturated fat uh, heavy diet. But the data on that's a little less clear cut. Great. Thank you for that. Um, actually, just real quickly, because I didn't ask you when we started this, um, where can people find your books? Uh, actually, I did put my clinic um, URL in the chat, uh, and I'll put another one. My major website is drjoelkahn.com, D-R-J-O-E-L-K-H-N, and the books are there. They're all linked to that large bookseller that starts with the letter A that everybody orders from. So there's six books, but if you go to my websites, there's hundreds of podcasts and articles and videos that are all available and free. Okay. That's my so, clinic website, the Con Center for Cardiac Longevity. And there is uh, a, a little button that says shop, and that will take you to the books if you want. The okay. top one. Yeah. If someone does everything right, they eat the whole food plant based diet and follow your prescriptions, um, can they still get heart disease? And if so, what are the factors that would contribute to that? Yeah, that's a great question. And my view as a cardiologist now for 33, 34 years, and you know, about seven years of training before that is, we are not bulletproof on a whole food plant-based diet. We are in the most optimal position we can be in for nutrition, but we have to obviously not smoke, needless to say, we have to fit fitness into our life. It can be small bursts or long durations. It doesn't have to be excessive. We have to get sleep. Sleep has come on board as a major measure of health, longevity, brain, and heart function. And uh, we have to know our genetics. If you have a family history of early heart attacks, a whole food plant-based diet is exactly what you should pick, but you should get tested. Just like the other question about the genetics of clotting, you should know your uh, inflammation panel in detail. You should know your lipoprotein little a. The last book I wrote is called Lipoprotein Little A, The Heart Silent Killer, a little blood test that even if you're on a whole food plant-based diet, you can develop plaque and heart attacks and stents and die. And I've seen that. And it's a powerful factor in some people. Homocysteine is a genetic uh, derived component that um, can be elevated despite a whole food plant-based diet because of genetics. I'm uh, very routinely checking genetic panels on my patients. It's an advanced clinic I run. And it's really interesting how uh, some of us are unfortunately born the gene APOE4. Um, yeah, the best diet is whole food plant-based, but it still is going to raise your risk of coronary heart disease and of early memory issues. So we have to modify things and test things and monitor things. So I, uh, I have more knowledge, more power. And you mentioned um, calcium scores during your presentation. Is calcified plaque, can that cause a heart attack? 
it's less prone to, but it's not completely innocent. How do we know that? There have been published studies in a few hundred patients where their plaque has been measured and characterized by those CT scans. And we know which spot is calcified, heavily calcified. We know which spot is soft, non-calcified. In follow-up, if a heart attack occurs or if a stent needs to be placed, it's more commonly in the segment that's non-calcified. In fact, there's something called, this is a technical term, the 1000K plaque, a very dense calcified plaque. They seem to be safe and stable, even though they keep showing up on those calcium scores. So it's abnormal, but it's of lower risk than that soft, more immature, uh, unstable plaque. Thank you. Um, Ruth, where are you from? What's your question? Uh, Canada. Uh, does this, um, uh, everything you've said, does it apply to, to this as well? Um, uh, Ruth, you're cutting out? Uh, a lot of the doctors want you on drugs right away, some of the older ones. I don't know about him. Uh, all right. Um, like this. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm i known as America's healthy heart doc and a natural doc, and I have training in that. But I mean, I spent 25 years in conventional cardiology, and I know my prescriptions. And you have to use the art and the science of medicine. Uh, what I tell patients, I think everybody needs to know this, that we are not on the same football field that Dr. Esselstyn, Ornish, and Mr. Pritikin were on 40 years ago. At that time, the knowledge was that LDL cholesterol could uh, raise the risk of heart attacks and death. And our goal line, that's the football analogy, our end zone was an LDL cholesterol of 100. And if we got near there or below there, we slammed the football and we celebrated. And I'm not a sports guy, but I'm going to keep up this analogy. But about a dozen years ago, data came out that lower LDL is better. And an LDL under 70 became the new end zone. Well, fewer people reach an LDL less than 70 on a whole food plant-based diet alone compared to LDLs less than 100. So if fewer people reach that end zone, there's going to be more need for either supplements or for prescription medication. And now the end zone got even further. And the end zone that we talk about is LDL cholesterol under 55 for advanced heart patients is the new goal. So it's not a spike when we get to LDL of 90. We're not slamming the football down. We're saying the whole food plant-based diet was amazing. Well, your LDL is still 98, not good enough. And that's where, again, supplements like niacin, red yeast rice, berberine, bergamot, and prescription drugs in my clinic in very low doses in combination like five milligrams of versuvastatin with 10 milligrams of ezetimibe based on some data out of Korea that's very convincing. Uh, I've got to get my patients to the end zone of the greatest safety. So it's diet plus anything else they need. So um, you were talking about statins in your presentation and I wanted to ask clarification. So you were talking, uh, obviously statins are known for lowering cholesterol. Did you also say that the statins can reverse plaque? Yes, the data, and I see it in my own patients now that I have a way to measure it with these artificial intelligence CT angiograms. What happens after about a year or two of statin therapy, obviously combined with diet, obviously combined with all other lifestyle components and some supplements, is the soft plaque drops dramatically. Some of it goes away. That's really exciting. It evaporates. Some of it converts to calcified hard plaque. So if you look two years later, the overall plaque is down. Miracle. It happens. The soft plaque is way down, but the calcified plaque is not. The calcified plaque went up a little bit. But since we have data that it's the more stable version, the net benefit to the patient is great. So why get another calcium score when the calcium score going up may not be a bad sign? So I don't do that. I get the more advanced tests if I can arrange it with the patient. Thank you. And you were talking about the, the study with uh, the Mediterranean diet and the endothelial function. Um, one of the things you mentioned, you know, and, and basically it was, show, it was showing based on your analysis that the, the um, 
the diet that was very low in fat actually did worse than the than the Mediterranean diet. But you also mentioned that they had lowered plant fats. Could that be a confounding factor in why perhaps that diet, you know, the low fat diet was unhealthy because they also took away what a lot of people in the plant based community would consider healthy fats? Right. I absolutely want to be sure we understand when we're talking about the cordio prep study, mm -hmm. there was a group called the lower fat group where the goal was less than 30% of calories from fats overall. Remember, Crete was around 40%. That's a traditional Mediterranean diet. So they dropped overall fats by more than 25%, but never would I call it a very low fat diet like Dr. Ornish, Esselstyn, Pritikin, or uh, Dr. Morrison. It's a lower fat diet. And then the other arm was a higher fat diet with extra virgin olive oil enhancement. Both were low trans fat and saturated fat diets, which is really key. So it's a lower fat versus a higher fat diet, but uh, nobody's put that third arm in of super low. And, you know, um, avocados are not typical of a Mediterranean diet. Nuts and seeds are. Um, and, uh, you know, there are fats in grains and there are fats in even fruits and vegetables of various types. Uh, olives are very typical as part of the diet in the Mediterranean diet. So they were still getting, I mean, when you have 25% of your calories from fat in a Mediterranean diet, some would say that's still more than enough and sizable and probably not the reason uh, that uh, there was a, such a profound benefit to the sort of Crete uh, traditional higher fat because of higher virgin olive oil diet. It's really remarkable that the research in the 50s and the 60s was completely reproduced with high technology 60 years later. Great, thank you. Uh, you have time for one more question, doctor? One more, let's go for it. We have got all, right. all, all Canada so far. All right, let's see where we're gonna get, we're gonna go right now. Yarn, where are you from and what's your question? Well, I am not from Canada, from Massachusetts. Uh, um, so my question is, Dr. Khan, if you have a patient that got a very high calcium score, can you compare the pros and cons uh, uh, of the CT angiogram that you mentioned with the artificial intelligence to nuclear st stress test, especially from perspective of radiation, cost, and effectiveness? Thank you. A remarkable question. It sounds like you're from Tunisia, but uh, I'm just guessing. Uh, and you might answer back and say, no, Morocco. Um, but welcome to Massachusetts for sure for a long time. So it's a really important question. Um, in traditional cardiology, we have relied on nuclear stress tests, either on a treadmill with an injection, uh, used to be called thallium, uh, now a different isotope, usually one called cardiolite, or for people that can't exercise, there's a chemical version, but you still get injected with radiation. I, for many years, was a nuclear cardiologist. I've published many papers I mentioned Dr. Kim Williams, my colleague now in Louisville. He was a nuclear cardiologist. We've known each other for decades because of those meetings, uh, really even back in the 1980s. That's how far back I'm talking. I almost never order a nuclear stress test now. Why? Um, a regular stress test might cost, just walk a treadmill, about $250, $300. Um, there's no radiation. There's no needle. Um, it's said to be about 70% accurate for uh, identifying poor blood flow to the heart. There's something called the stress echo, where you add ultrasound pictures to the heart before and after, uh, raises the test to about you know, $500, $600, sometimes less, um, makes the test a little longer, 30 minutes instead of 20 minutes, um, increases the accuracy to maybe 80 or 85%, um, but involves no radiation. A nuclear stress test is generally, the radiation is twice that of a heart catheterization, 15 times that of a calcium CT scan, and maybe about five times that of a CT angiogram with the artificial intelligence. So I, I generally view them as nuclear radiation excessive choices at only a very small increase in accuracy. Maybe the 80% goes to 85%. They have many flaws, what are called false positives, false negatives. And generally, I, I reserve nuclear stress tests for people that can't exercise, 
because the best chemical stress test is a chemical nuclear scan, unfortunately, and for the very obese. For the very obese, a nuclear stress test or a nuclear PET scan may be preferable because the echo pictures may be difficult. But uh, it should be a very small amount. And in terms of cost, depending on location, a nuclear stress test clearly is the most expensive, can be well over a thousand, over fifteen hundred dollars. It's a profit source for a clinic and a hospital, but I don't think it's a good patient choice. When you can do a clearly artificial intelligence CT angiogram, same cost as a nuclear stress test, about one fifth the radiation, about um, 20% of the time involved, it's a much quicker test, uh, just as safe. And information, I mean, no comparison uh, on the information. It's much greater from the CT test. Great. And with that, we come to an end of our question and answer. I want to wish you a happy belated birthday. Thank you. And I just want to thank you. And if we can unmute the audience so they can share their thanks as well. Thank you. 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 Thank you.